So if you ever thought about it, maize or uh, corn is a plant that has a very human sized uh, stature, right? It's as high as a human. You can walk uh, through it. You can look at it, at its eyes, right? At its flowers, etc. And as you can see here uh, on the right, uh, near of corn fits very well on a hand, right? And we think that this uh, human size stature of the uh, of the plant uh, has been uh, very important for the process of domestication and expansion of corn across the world. So uh, today I will uh, tell you a little bit about how maize was domesticated, expanded, how it is used across the world, and the risk that it faces with uh, climate change, and the possible solutions uh, to uh, address those risks that uh, scientists are, uh, uh, are uh, uh, using. So maize was domesticated uh, here in the southwest of uh, Mexico from its wild relative that we know as Teosinte parviglumis. And from there, it very quickly uh, moved to Central America and to South America. It reached the uh, highlands of the uh, Andes uh, around 6,000 uh, years ago. And then it moved to other areas of uh, South America. It also reached the highlands of uh, Mexico around that uh, same time, going into the Amazon uh, through the high deserts of uh, Mexico. It made it to the southwest uh, of the uh, U.S. There was a second route of corn through the south of the U.S. And these northern, what we know, northern flints and southern dents gave rise to most of the corn uh, that is grown today in the, in the Midwest. When the uh, Europeans uh, got to uh, Mexico, uh, they very quickly uh, transported uh, to Europe as well. Today, uh, corn is the crop with the largest uh, geographical uh, bread, and more corn is grown uh, in more places than any other crop. Corn is grown from the Midwest Corn Belt, one of the most productive areas of the world. Two other smallholder farmers' fields, like this one in, in El Salvador, what is uh, usually co-cultivated with other species uh, like beans. Corn is also grown for a variety of purposes. Uh, here in the U.S., we all enjoy a fresh sweet uh, corn on the cob that we bought in the farmer's market. And we probably drove to the uh, market uh, using a car fueled with a blend of uh, gasoline and corn ethanol. Corn is also a fundamental part of the diet uh, across Latin America and other places in the world. Yes, in Mexico, more than 600 dishes use corn as their base ingredient. And uh, for all these different uh, dishes, uh, humans have selected for different physical chemical properties. So it's not the same to uh, do this uh, small tortilla that you see here on the left, or this big tortilla that you see on the right used to make a, what is called a guarache. So humans have adapted uh, corn to a variety of environments, but then there's a second uh, step of adaptation uh, in the kitchen. And we have gotten uh, pretty good at growing uh, corn uh, very uh, effectively, as you can see in this yield graph from the last century. So through a combination of uh, breeding, improved uh, agronomical practices, increased fertilizer uh, supply, corn yields have kept increasing during the last uh, century without really any sign that they will stop. The question is, uh, will we be able to keep up the production of corn uh, in the face of uh, climate change? The different models predict uh, a loss of uh, corn yield between uh, 10% and up to 30%. Climate change is already impacting areas where corn is a staple. This picture is from an article on the New York Times that uh, shows how Indigenous populations living in Central America are uh, forced to uh, move from the areas where they uh, grow because corn cannot uh, deal with uh, the different uh, impacts of climate change, including uh, hurricanes and droughts, etc. So uh, again, the question is, will we be able to maintain production, particularly uh, in areas where corn is a fundamental uh, basis of human nutrition? So uh, one way to do this is to look at uh, current climate data and also uh, different uh, geolocated uh, accessions of, of corn for which we have genotypes. So by doing this, we can classify the different uh, genotypes and associate these genotypes with environmental 
uh, conditions. So with these um, associations between current uh, uh, genotypes and environmental uh, data, we can go uh, back to uh, past environmental uh, data and uh, make associations with current genotypes and this historic series of environmental uh, data. Researchers like my colleague Dan Gates here are using environmental and genotypic information of maize varieties adapted to a particular environment. And with future climate change uh, models, we can ask if uh, we have enough genotypic uh, diversity to be able to, to grow corn in those future climate environmental scenarios. So then we can compare uh, the genetic uh, diversity of uh, present and past uh, maize uh, varieties and use those with the predicted genotypes that will be required to maintain current yields in the future. And as you can see here, the future uh, genotypes that we will need in 2081 are not covered by the current genotypes. If we do this exercise, the results are striking. With current climate predictions, we will require an approximate equivalent of around a thousand years of evolution to produce uh, genotypes that currently do not exist. We can do better than just uh, evolution by itself. And with tools like genomic selection, we have varieties that have been genotyped and evaluated in multi-environmental trials. And uh, using uh, genomic selection uh, models, we can pick up the best genotypic combinations to face these uh, future climate uh, scenarios. So this is a, a technology that is uh, being currently used uh, by uh, breeding uh, companies. Additionally, we have a large uh, untapped diversity uh, of uh, corn. There are around 300,000 uh, accessions. There are seed samples that were collected in areas and smallholder farmers fields across the world. And many uh, researchers think that within these germplasm uh, banks there are hidden varieties or hidden genotypes that will help us to increase the nutritional uh, value of corn, help us uh, develop uh, new varieties that are more resistant to abiotic stresses such as uh, cold or extreme heat uh, diseases such as uh, tar spot uh, complex, improve our ability to develop uh, varieties that need less fertilizer to still produce the same uh, yield. Or maybe among these varieties, we'll find, again, a variety that is uh, resistant to striga, which is a parasitic plant. There is a real problem in Africa. It fits on the roots of other plants and is impacting corn yields in vast areas of uh, Africa. An example of the use of traditional variety is this story that came out three, four years ago. Uh, researchers from uh, the University of uh, Wisconsin and California uh, in Davis. They work with an indigenous uh, group in Oaxaca, uh, Mexico, and they identify this traditional variety that is able to produce this mucilage in the aerial uh, roots. And this mucilage, which is a slimy compound uh, with a lot of sugars, is able to attract nitrogen uh, fishing uh, bacteria and reducing uh, the amount of nitrogen that, external nitrogen that would be needed to be applied to this plant. I should uh, also say that um, uh, even though we have uh, made this uh, historic recount of uh, uh, maize domestication and, and, and expansion, uh, this process of uh, adaptation of uh, corn and uh, this process of uh, increasing the genetic uh, diversity uh, of corn is not over. And in countries like uh, Mexico, smallholder farmers keep making crosses and, and mixing uh, genetically different uh, varieties. And this is a great resource of uh, genetic diversity that we should protect and support. Another uh, uh, approach uh, that uh, researchers uh, are using are uh, technologies such as uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, uh, or uh, gene editing that allows you to uh, make precise uh, changes in small regions uh, of the uh, genome. 
this is an example of how we can uh, apply gene editing to maize. This was uh, work from colleagues at Cold Spring uh, Harbor. And using gene editing, they modify this uh, gene, class 7, that, as you can see, changes the morphology of the ear. And eventually, it may allow us to increase the number of kernel rows in an ear and therefore increase uh, yield. So uh, I hope that you have uh, learned uh, something new today uh, about uh, the history of uh, maize and uh, the things that uh, scientists uh, are doing to uh, keep up with the challenges of uh, climate change. And uh, we hope that all the folks that use corn as their staple, they will be able to still keep their hands full of corn.